1 Corinthians chapter 10. Lessons from then. Say then. Lessons from then. Lessons for now. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We'll begin to read from verse 1. Moreover, brethren... I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. We preached on that last week, the children of Israel coming to the Red Sea and the Egyptians behind them closing in, hemmed in, and it took a miracle. And sometimes God brings us to what seems to be impossible situations. And then somehow he brings us through it. And this is one of the lessons from then that we need to learn this morning. It says, And all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Powerful reading. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. I wonder if he's pleased with us this morning. I wonder if he's pleased with us as individuals or our families or our church this morning. I hope he's pleased. Everybody said. But with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these were our examples. Lessons from them. Lessons from them and lessons from them. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lost it. We shouldn't do what they done. We should learn the lesson. Neither be ye, neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That's when they made the, uh, the, the calf the, of the gold and their earrings and all the rest, but they made a god unto themselves to allow them to go and do whatever they wanted to do. Are people doing that today, Pastor? 100% yes. They create a god of their imagination as they did. And this god, they... This God allows them to do whatever they want to do because if you read that story, if you have time today, it says they built an altar at it. They worshipped it. There's many people worshipping gods that's allowing them to live sinful, to live whatever way they want. We've got to learn these lessons, lessons from then. Neither for it. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. You get time during the week. Why don't you read the book of Exodus? and the book of Numbers, and, and, and see all these offense that took place. And it's powerful. And if you can learn from them lessons from them, it's going to safe, safeguard you now. And that's the heart of this message this morning. 
Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur. There's nobody in here murmurs. Everybody said, we're not murmurers. Never complain. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for our ensamples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh that he standeth take heed, lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Hallelujah, but God is faithful. I serve a faithful God. Do you ever wonder why you're making it, why, you've, why you're still going on with him after all these years? Or is the reason we serve a faithful God? Even when we have been unfaithful, he remains faithful. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. I can't help myself. Yes, you can. According to this word, yes, you can. With God's help, you can be an overcomer. With God's help, you can make it. Boys, I tell you, cut the atmosphere with a knife, and this is only the reading. God's word is powerful, you see. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Cuts asunder, doesn't it? It's a two-way sword. It's coming back this way as well, brothers and sisters. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Three times Paul went with his complaint, whatever it was. Take it away, take it away, take it away, God says no. But this is what he said there, my grace is sufficient. Hallelujah. We serve a faithful, sufficient God. His grace is sufficient. Hallelujah. Wherefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. And we'll close there. And may the Lord add a blessing to the reading of this, his precious word. Let's pray. Father, this morning, will you bless your word? On to our hearts. Will you glorify your name and help us to take lessons from them? Apply that lesson to our own personal hearts, to our families, to this church, Father, to learn from other people's experiences, good and bad. And may we, Father, glorify your name. We bring Tucker before you. And Michaela standing at his bedside, as she will. And we pray your richest blessing upon them. We pray healing over his broken body this morning. I pray that you will heal it completely. That you will astound the medical profession. That a cry will go out, this is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. Glorify the lovely name of Jesus. Let them know your peace right now, Father. Let the peace that is in this room be in that hospital room this morning. Let them know your strength. Let them know your lovely presence. Glorify your name. In Jesus' name we ask it. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. If only we could learn from other people's experiences, we would save ourselves so much sorrow and so much pain. How many mothers and fathers have made 
mistakes in their lives that cost them years of happiness, brought them to years of poverty, and spent years in pain and wasted those years of precious time. How they wish, and I'm speaking from experience, and I know many of you as well, how many wish this morning that their sons and their daughters, their grandsons and their granddaughters, would listen and learn by their mistakes, and somehow it would possibly be worth it. Those things that we went through that when we look back we cringe. We wish we'd never have turned to the left, we should have turned to the right. We wish we hadn't have stopped, but we tarried in the places that we shouldn't have tarried. We went with the wrong crowd. We'd done the wrong things, and we paid for it. And it left us in pain and poverty. And now we have our own children. We watch them as little children, and we begin to bring them up. And this has happened to so many born-again believers because they got saved at a late age. I, I don't know how many testimonies I've listened to over the years, hundreds and hundreds of them. And so many of them have said the same thing. I wish I'd have got saved when I was younger. I wish I had got saved when I was younger and I wouldn't have made those mistakes. But it's too late. Those mistakes have been made. But can I throw this in? There is a God in heaven who says, I will restore the years unto you that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar have eaten. And somehow, and I don't know how he does it, no more than I know how he raises the dead, no more than I know he gives sight to the blind eyes or, or hearing to the deaf ears or lifts someone out of a wheelchair, lifts somebody from poverty, lifts somebody up. I don't understand it, brothers and sisters, how he restores the years that have been eaten, that have been wasted. And I know men and women who lived horrible lives and Jesus Christ has saved them and turned them around and now their heart's desire is that all people would learn from their lessons what they went through, what they've done, what they shouldn't have done. How many mothers and fathers have stood in front of their children, their grandchildren saying, please listen to me. Don't do that. Don't go there. Don't touch this. Don't touch that. Listen to me, and it'll go well for you. And this is what we're showing you this morning. How they wish their sons and daughters, grandsons and granddaughters, would listen and learn by their mistakes, and somehow it would possibly have been all worth it. Our message this morning is full of people who made mistakes, made silly, stupid mistakes, and the Scriptures has recorded their lowest points in life in order that we might avoid doing the same things and avoid falling into the same pit as they did. Lessons from then can help you and I turn from the inevitable consequences of reaping the same harvest that they did and learn how to reap a harvest that is fit for the master's use. And everybody said, lessons from then and lessons from now. Romans chapter 15 and 4 says these words, for whatsoever things were written aforetime or whatsoever things were written then were written for our learning. 
The NIV, the New International Version, puts it like this. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. This book, brothers and sisters, is a guide to your life. Take heed to it. Learn from it. Learn from other people's mistakes and save yourself a heap of trouble. In First Chronicles chapter 7, well-known portion of Scripture that we have preached on many times, but I just want to I want to pick out the the main lessons of these. I have I think I have five of them. I'm hoping to get through the five of them. Second Chronicles chapter seven fourteen. You could all by now I'm sure quote this from memory. Says, if my people. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, then, lessons from then, then, not before, everybody said, not before. Then will I hear from heaven. And the question we must ask is, is there times when God's not even listening? Well, I can tell you when the children of Israel rose up to play, he wasn't listening. When, they, when every mom was doing that which was right in his own eyes and sinning with importunity, God was not listening. But in his mercy and in his faithfulness to his own promises, he says to them, if my people that are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray. One of the hardest things for a child of God to do is to humble themselves. Because we're full of pride and we get full of anger and we get full of things that keep us from humbling ourselves. Someone who has never been humbled, they miss out so much in life. They go through life angry. A chip on their shoulder. And that chip wears them down. But God says to that person this morning, humble yourself. And if you humble yourself under God, he'll lift you up. If my people that are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray. 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 Now, brothers and sisters, this is not a message on prayer this morning, but can I ask you, when was the last time you prayed? And I'm not saying getting out of bed in the morning. Morning, Lord, and getting back in. Thank you, Lord. Brothers and sisters, that's not prayer. When was the last time you spent time with them? Get into your car, drive away to you, a secluded spot, middle of winter, rain pouring, turn the lights off, just sit there and pray. Or keep the engine on and keep warm, I don't care. You get out of bed in the morning, and you kneel at your bed before you go out. We've got that used to it, but just get out of bed before you go. At some time of the day, if lucky, we go, I should have prayed. And even that prompting, I believe, is off the Holy Spirit. We ask you, when was the last time you prayed? Humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Seek him. Not what he can give you, not his hand. To seek him for who he is. By the way, when you find him, you find life. 
You find him, you'll find everything else you're seeking for. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added on to you. All the things you're running about worrying, God can sort it out in a moment for you. Humble themselves and pray and seek my face and watch this. Turn. Turn from their wicked ways. Why would you want to live in sin? Why would you want to continue doing what you know to be wrong? That is displeasing to God. When God says that if you turn from your wicked ways, then, hallelujah, then I'll hear, then I'll forgive. And then I'll heal the land. The land where you live. The land where you walk. Your home. Your circumstances. Then will I heal. Lessons from then. It's simple. Repent. That's what this is asking the church to do. This is what is asking the church which his body out there wherever they are, to repent. Then he will hear. And when God hears, when you know that he hears, I wish I had time this morning. When you know he hears, sometimes that's all you need to know. Without circumstances changing even, you just know God says, I hear you. It's enough. Do you remember Nathaniel? Oh, I wish I had time. I could preach, the way I feel this morning, I could preach for five hours. Remember Nathaniel? When I was under the tree, when I was under the, I saw you. What? Whatever he was doing, whatever he was praying, he knew that he was in front of Almighty. It was enough. Sometimes to know that he hears you is enough. Then will I hear. Then will I forgive. forgive and then will I heal their land. Will they get a drink? The second lesson from then is found over in Joshua. Joshua chapter 1. Say praise the Lord. Make sure you are all still with me. Joshua chapter 1. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The book of Joshua chapter 1. I love this reading. I'm sure this doesn't apply to too many in this room this morning, but in case there's somebody listening, even down the line, do you feel a bit of a failure? Do you feel that nothing seems to go right for you, no matter what you put your hand to? And yet you would love for things to change. You would love God to bless you. Love God to bless what you're doing. You would love God to change your circumstances. You would love God to open a door that no man can shut and possibly shut a door that no man can open. Possibly give you favor. Listen to this reading. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. Speaking of the Bible, speaking of the Word of God, it says, this book of the law, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Do you remember I preached a wee message a while ago about chewing the cud, <laughs> chewing the Word of God over. It's not just a matter of reading it for the sound. Ah, well, I read three chapters. Of, and that's good. Keep reading. Keep reading. But sometimes I've opened the Word of God, and I, I, I think it's as I'm getting older this happens. And, and that's why I never get a message finished, very rarely. Because I could read... A first, I could read a half a first and be at it for a half an hour. It just explodes. The older you get, all these things are coming to your mind. And it's then I believe you're reading more for quality than quantity. Both are important. But when you've read for quantity when you were young, as you get older, brothers and sisters, as you're reading, 
It's like the Word of God becomes alive again. And it's hard sometimes, to, just like I'm doing right now, it's hard to get off a verse. But let's get off it. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Chew it over. But thou shalt meditate. Thou shalt meditate therein. You ready for this? Day and night. I haven't time to read the Bible, Pastor. Make time. It's so important. And it's not just for head knowledge. Because I know a whole lot of people with a whole lot of head knowledge. And I bore the life out of you. Just been honest. Everybody said, thank you. I thought I was the only one. <laughs> this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate it, meditate therein day and night. Hey, watch this. This is the hard bit. That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. So what you're reading, you're going to apply it to your life. But it's sore, Pastor. I know. It cuts you asunder. I know. But if you apply it to your life, I can tell you now. The master physician will heal everything that's wrong in you. And what once slayed you will now bless you. The first cut is the deepest. Stay in it long enough. It's like a mirror. When you come to it, you see yourself. You see your own reflection. But what we do is we put the hood over our head, don't we? We walk up to the mirror and we go, that's like me in the mornings. I walk into the bathroom to have my shower and there's a big mirror on the wall and I go, and then I have my shower and I'm stunning. <laughs> that, I know it's not nice, but sometimes just stay in front of the mirror to get sorted out. The mirror of God's word. Jesus makes you beautiful. Stay there. That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then. Lessons from then. Lessons for now. Then. When you do this, oh, child of God. And I feel the presence of God as I'm standing here saying this to you. Because my soul's rejoicing that this can happen to you. Then. Oh, I pray that you will prosper even as your soul prospers, every one of you. That God will give you his ideas. Do you know people have woke up with an idea in the morning and I never knew where it was heading to. Marks and Spencers. Mark and Spencer. I thank them for the yellow stickers every morning. Had a wee trolley and they pushed it out onto the road and sold at the marketplace. Now they have a shop in every town and city in the United Kingdom. And they've won over in Rhodes, if you ever go to the Greek islands. I near died. I turned a corner and I saw and she had her 20% with her off. I was like, what a holiday. <laughs> Hallelujah. They should sponsor me for throwing that in there, but anyway. When you do this, it says, for then. Watch this. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. And then thou shalt have good success. But that's got maybe nothing to do, Pastor, with everything that I'm doing over here. You see, it's seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added on to you. You study in the Word of God to do what is contained, that you find contained within here, and a plan it to your life, standing in front of Admiral and saying, Right, Lord, from this day, I'm going to do it your way. 
Show me what to do from your word. I'm going to start reading it and see whatever I find. I'm going to do it, Lord. Now, put the Lord to the test if you like. I guarantee you, see the child that comes before him with that attitude, he's going to speak to you. He's going to open this word to you. And you're going to start to see things. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. And that's what he does. You begin to see things like you never saw them before. And some of them's going to apply to you personally. And you might be standing and saying, Lord, I don't know if I can do this. It's so difficult for me to do this. And you'll hear a voice saying to you, do it and I'll help you. I don't know if I can do this. My grace is sufficient for you. Lord, I have messed up. My mercy endures forever. Lord, I have fallen. I will lift you up. Do it according to this word. Repent. Humble yourself. Pray. Seek my face. Turn from your wicked ways. Then will I hear. Then, brothers and sisters, you will be successful. Say praise the Lord. What time? Number three. I've got to stay on that point to the end, if I'm honest with you. I'm like pulling myself away from it. Go with me to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Lessons from then to repent, to read. And a lesson to relay. What are you talking about, Pastor? You'll see. The story here before is, is that of David coming out of one of the most darkest times of his life. King David, man after God's own heart. I love David. I love his psalms. I love reading them. I love, I love everything about him. even love his mistakes. Because I'm learning from then not to make the same mistake now. I'm seeing what it cost him and I don't want to pay that. This comes at a very dark time in this man's life. When he's messed up, at the time when kings went off to battle, David tarried behind Jerusalem, had a lazy fit. Get off his bed, went up onto the rooftop, and there was Bathsheba bathing. And she was beautiful. The scripture tells you she was beautiful. Satan will not tempt you with something. He'll tempt you what's beautiful. But anyway, he goes up and he sees her. He calls for her. And he was told, she's the wife of Uriah, your faithful servant who's out in the battlefield fighting. I know, but bring her to me. Sin has no boundaries. Sin doesn't even have a conscience. Did you know that? That's why you've got to destroy sin before it destroys you. And you know what happened. The inevitable. He lay with her. She fell pregnant. And he tried to cover it. There's only one person can cover sin. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And that sin must first be confessed. Confess it, forsake it, and he'll forgive it. And so they try to cover it up. When that didn't happen, he sent Uriah to the hottest, most part of the battle. A man who loved him. I remember one of the first times I read that story. I remember saying, what a faithful God. The goodness of God. Uriah never knew what had happened. God took him home. There's some things worse than going home to be with the Lord, you know. And he had to watch this. Or he, God spurred him from watching this, but the child died. 
consequences of sin. Well, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And it's not payday yet for many. But anyway, Nathan is sent to him. See the person that tries to keep you right before God. If you don't realize that they're precious, most precious person you have in front of you is the person that's trying to get through to you if you're doing wrong. And then people are hated for it. Who do they think they are? I remember them when they did nothing. See a brother sin a sin unto death. Let him that is spiritual go and reprove such a one in the spirit of meekness. A person that comes to you in that spirit of meekness and says, Brother, sister, can I talk to you? Sort yourself out before it's too late. That's a precious brother and a precious sister. And they'll go. The only person they'll talk about it to is your Lord. They're precious. Nathan comes to him. Tells him the story of the little ewe lamb. Oh boy, he piled it on. Nathan was good. Read the story. He says he was like a daughter to him. This little ewe lamb brought it into the house. Fed it at the table like me and Pippa. Goes everywhere with me. This little ewe lamb, if he goes to Tesco's, the wee ewe lamb sitting in the car beside him. Pass a year, Maud. You leave my people. I'd rather have people than some people. <laughs> and I make no apologies for saying it. And I hear Gunner up the back, are you two, son? That dog's not saved, I'm not, I'll tell you. I've prayed over that dog that much. He goes out me early in the morning. His father. And then if I meet somebody to witness, he just lays down because he knows he's going to be there half a day. He just lays down. <laughs> yeah, the wee you lamb. And he says, his next door neighbor had lambs running all over the place. Everything heart could desire. And he says, you know what? I'm going to take his wee ewe lamb and I'm going to feed him. And David's standing getting more and more angry. Hey, what? Over a little ewe lamb? Can I just throw this in? We're hypocrites. See human nature? He done what? What should happen to him? Oh, he should die. For a little you lamb. And he let him go on, and I can see Nathan standing watching him. They were going on another anger. This puffed up anger. How dare he do something like that? Nathan just waited to the right moment. He says, David, what? He says, Thou art the man. Just caught him. It's you, David. Now we come there, right? This is David's prayer of repentance. He comes to the God who can forgive these things. Listen to the cry of his heart. Have mercy upon me, O God. According to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Only God can do that. See every sin that I have ever committed and confessed. He has forgiven it. It's as if I have never sinned before. And you know what he says? And I will remember it no more. See if I get there. No, let me rephrase that. See when I get there. Remember the wee woman in here? I come away in one. She and know me. That night of the... The prophecies all went off here that Saturday night. It was fantastic. What a night. Wishes all had been in here. She was sitting where Alexis is sitting. And she was smaller than you, Alexis. She was 87. 
And I just read my resignation. Just there. Now I know why I'm here. Scared a life out of me. And I was standing, Chandler was standing, rubbing my back, reading my resignation. She's standing, rubbing my back, and the tears running down my face. Now I know why I'm here. Now I know why I'm here. She says, I have never met you before. I said, no. I have never spoke to you before. She came right out and round. Her eyes, and I'm not being drummed, were flames of fire. The fire of God was coming from her eyes. She says, but I saw you before. I saw you over seven and a half years ago. That's when we had opened this place. She couldn't have known that. I saw you over seven and a half years ago. And God has had me praying and interceding for you from that day to this. And the Lord would say unto you, Thus saith the Lord, and off she went and she prophesied over this place and this work. This work's safe, by the way. So at the end of it, she says, And the Lord hath other things to say to you, but in secret saith the Lord, Go bless ye, and she turn and she walk back. And then we mark it over in the weights of tea. Thus saith the Lord, this is that that I spoke of on the night of your ordination 15 years before. Hadn't seen her in 15 years and she's there. This is that that I spoke of. Oh, hers the back of my axe up. Wait, I got a drink. Help me. The wee woman I went round to her. Tell her this is the reason I'm telling you this. I went round to her and I said, you said the Lord had other things to say to me. Do you know what they are? She says, yes. I says, what? So she started, and I says, all right, don't need that speech. Just give me the interpretation of it. <laughs> Tell me what you know. She says, as the Lord showed me you, oh, seven and a half years ago, so this night he has shown you to a multitude of people all over the world. They will now intercede and pray for you. And the prayers that they pray, will manifest in the days that lie ahead in this room and wherever you go to preach the gospel. And she told me a couple of other things. She says, you will never meet these men on earth. You will not know who they are. But when you go to heaven, you will not need to ask who they are, for you will know them, for you will know as you are known, saith the Spirit. Oh, I walked out them doors like, oh. Oh, how do you actually ask a brother to come close to this meeting? At that night, just absolutely. Why am I telling you all this? Heaven. I'm going to heaven. Hallelujah. Anybody want to come with me? Study this word night and day, then apply it to your heart and your lives. You'll go to heaven. That's your guide. Holy Ghost will take you. He'll guide you when you're in this word. Thy word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. Thou shalt hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. Walk in it. Turn not to the left or the right. But keep walking, keep fighting. See no matter what happens. See no matter what comes your way. See no matter what folly you come to. No matter what backy you come to. Just keep on putting one foot after another. Just keep on walking. But this is coming against me. I don't understand that. I know, but keep on going. Just keep on walking with God. How's your walk? Say praise the Lord. I'm almost at this point. <laughs> to relay this to others here, ready? First 12 of our reading. David, this is his cry to God. I think this is beautiful. First 12, he says, restore. I serve a God who can restore. I shall restore the years that the canker worm, the caterpillar, the canker worm has eaten. God gave that reading to my wife after we got saved. She never told me for years. She keeps enough a lot of things to herself. Years later, she says, we'll be all right. God told me. I says, hi. And that was the first. I restore the years. It goes on to say, my people shall never be ashamed. He knows how to look after his own. Watch this. Restore on to me the joy. You know what that tells me? David had lost his joy. Sin will make you lose your joy. Everybody said and you're ready for this. The joy of the Lord is your. You lose your strength. 
If thou faintest in the day of adversity, it's because thy strength is small. I'm hearing scriptures from the back eyes. I don't know where they're coming at me. <laughs> restore. Boy, he can restore. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. By the way, do you remember it? Revelation says, I have somewhat against you. You've stopped loving me as you did at the beginning. You've lost your joy. You've lost your spark. Do you remember what it, I'm taking you back. Do you remember what it felt like when you first got saved? I don't know about you, but I tell you, I danced all over Mount Vernon in my wife's room, so I didn't care. I must have been some sight, but anyway. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Watch this. Then, after this happens, then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. David saying, let me paraphrase it, Lord. See if you get me back to where I was. See if you'll get me back to those days when I was full of joy. Your joy was my strength. See if you can forgive me, blot out my transgressions, and restore this on to me. He says, Lord, I'll tell everybody about you. He says, then they'll turn to you, even through my mistakes. Have you any idea how many people have repented over David's story? Have you any idea how many a Saturday night or a Sunday night when the gospel has been preached? And this story of David has been preached and somebody sitting who 20, 30, 40 years ago done the same thing and has told nobody about it and God is bringing it up before them. Does God do that? See, when I was under conviction, I was remembering things that I'd done Ten years before, Polak's drunk in the middle of a club. Things that I was cringing at. Things that I wish that I wasn't. But as they all came in front, I'm sorry, Lord. Oh, forgive me, forgive me. God, please help me. That was the three days that I went through hell. And then he restored unto me. Or he gave me this joy. You can relay to others through the experience of God's mercy and forgiveness in your own personal lives, in your own personal experiences. After the joy, the strength returns, and you can relay to others and share what God has done for you. I touched on that last week. They go, who go through this folly of Baca. It says they go from strength to strength. And in that strength, as they recover, they're able to go to people. I've actually took back out of that whole message last week, and I'm going to put it on on its own, because I believe it'll help so many. If you ever need a help in hand, go to the person who's been through what you've been through. Everybody said, there's things that you could come to me with and I could sympathize. And sympathy's okay. But there's nobody like coming to who can empathize and say, sit down. I know what you're going through. I'm looking at wee Jenny. Lost her husband and left with two wee children. You know anybody who's lost a husband and left with two weeks, you go and speak to her. God brought her through it. Everybody said. People who have come through things are the people who will strengthen you and direct you and comfort you in a time of trouble. 
Say praise the Lord. Psalm 56. If I flip the page, I'm at Psalm 56. I'm almost there. I don't think I'll get everything finished, but I'll give you the headings of it. Number four. Psalm 56. First nine. Boy, is of a this lesson. Time and time again in this house. When I cry unto thee. Say when. When I cry unto thee. Then, say then. Then shall mine enemies be turned back. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. If I have somebody coming against me, I don't confront them, I go to God. And I tell God to confront them. Take my example. And I've had plenty come against me. And a whole lot of times I've wanted to go and confront them myself. But God has says, David, and I go, okay. And I come to him. And I cry on to him. And this is what the scripture says. When I cry on to thee, then shall mine enemies but turn back. This I know. Why? For God is for me. See, when you're doing it God's way. I think this is brilliant. You know he's for you. You can't do it his way and think he's against you. It's when you're going against his way, then you're wondering. But when you're doing it his way, you know, this I know for God is for me. There's a cry that God hears and it turns back the enemy. You have to cry that yourself, by the way. I can't explain it even to you. I could try. But it's a certain cry that you cry. Mixed in in that cry, there is actually in you mercy and forgiveness. There's also anger. (laughs) There's also confusion. There's all of these things in your cry. But you're crying it before God. And he understands it. Go into your closet, close the door, pray to your father in secret, and your father who sees in secret. Not here, sees. He sees what you're trying to say. He knows the whole sum total of that prayer. And that cry, you get to that place where you're willing, what, Lord, I'll do whatever this takes. I forgive. I forgive them who have trespassed against me. Lord, I bless them who are cursing me. Lord, I forgive. Lord, I do. I cry and own to you. But Lord, they're coming against. But Lord, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. I believe somewhere in that is the cry that God hears. And then he moves. And then we look back. And the enemy's not there anymore. <laughs> Children of Israel went over the Red Sea when they looked back. The chariots and the horses and the men had fallen. They get drowned. Book of Hebrews put it like this. And the children of the children of Egypt, a saying to do what the children of Israel they drowned. You see, you need the Holy Ghost to do God's work. The unsaved can't do it. If the lessons that I'm teaching you, you need the Holy Ghost to do these. And He's in you. And here's the thing I wouldn't preach it if I didn't think for one minute that you could do this. Through his strength, you can do it. I'm almost there. No, I'm not. I'm only halfway through this, but I'm going to have to close. There's a cry that God hears, and it turns back the enemy. Verse 9 says, When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies be turned back. This I know, for God is for me. In Psalm 34 and 6, my favorite verse, This poor man cried, then... The Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. And I know one, one person in here has got this printed in the back of their Bible. The Lord saved him out of his troubles, not because of his troubles, but because of his cry. Then he came. The cry that he hears, the cry that he, to finish. I know I'm five minutes over. I'm going to be five minutes over, but... I want to finish this. To finish, 
I want to make a statement. Just because you've repented, you've read the Word of God to do all that is found therein, you've relayed, you've reached out through your own experiences, you've rejoiced in the joy of the Lord which has been restored on thee and is your strength and every hallelujah, praise God, this is wonderful. Don't expect plain sailing. In Matthew 3, 17, and Matthew 4 and 1, let me read the two verses and I'll close. Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is at his baptism in the River Jordan with John the Baptist. It says, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Then, in verse 1 of chapter 4, it says, Then. After this. So you think, I'm going to do all these things and everything's going to be, oh, not necessarily. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Every child of God will suffer at different times of their lives. But I would personally suffer doing God's will than suffer going against it. 1 Peter 3.17 says, For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. And in Romans 15 and 4 says, as I close, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written then were written for our learning. Learn from other people's experiences. Lessons from then. Lessons for now. May the Lord bless. I, anybody feel his presence here? Is it just me? Oh. Hallelujah.